It's 419 on a Tuesday, and welcome to Taxi's Very Late Quarantini Happy Hour. Please let me know that you've got me, guys. I'm so sorry and so embarrassed. Apparently, uh, there was a wrong setting, and I wasn't coming through, and I see all that activity happening in the chat room. I had no idea that you guys weren't hearing me, and I just did the best 18 minutes of monologue ever. Seriously, it was my very, very, very best. Oh, man. Okay, well, we will go a little long today. Um, I want to let you know, I'm just basically going to repeat everything that I just did. Um, I really thought that you guys were hearing me. So, uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, a thing that Andre Stepanian dropped in the comments yesterday, which was, I'd like to have a library owner for a Q&A. I'd like to know why libraries don't have a submission email on their website, do not want to be solicited, and don't send you any current listings that they want after you've established a relationship. How do you approach them? Are they basically telling you we only use A&R companies, like Taxi, uh, for our music needs? Uh, that yes, there are a lot of YouTube videos on how to prepare an introductory email, but I'd like to know from you and your guest. Well, I don't have a guest, but we are going to talk about why libraries, most of them, um, really don't want, they certainly don't want unsolicited stuff, and those that uh, have the submission capability on their website um, kind of live to regret that in many cases. Uh, so there you go. So uh, let me say a quick hello to everybody in the chat room now, you, now that we're all connected. Um, let's see, I'm not going to go all the way back here, but we've got Nancy Kalel, Ken Messford, Terrell Beckless, Martin Gravel, Rick Barassa, Ewart Williams, Simon Burnham, Dan Weber, um, Dave Barnett, uh, let's see, Jesse J. Peck, um, Heidi Owen, Ken Mesford. Okay, anyway, um, so you do have me loud and clear, right? Uh, there's Paul House, great to see you. Um, Alex Dillon, Dean Turner, the regular cast of characters are here. Dave Vera Kelly. Um, okay, so we're, we are going to talk about submitting music to music libraries in a moment. Uh, before that, I would like to go back and mention to you that our buddy, longtime taxi member, wow, look how my skin tone changed. Whoa. My, <laughs> I don't know how to deal with that. Look, I look like a dead person. Um, anyway, this book is brand new from Steve Barton called Deconstructing Production Music for TV. And what makes it different is that it totally lays out... Um, everything you want to know about a particular cue. He's got links where you can go listen to the cue and then it will list which instruments, very specifically uh, which instruments um, he used on the cue. So you can listen to it, you can see the chart, you can read that the instruments in this particular thing called Beyond the Stars, uh, he used Spitfire woodwinds, piccolo flutes, clarinets, bassoon, uh, Berlin woodwinds for the oboe, cinebrass for the 12 French horns, trumpets and trombones, cineperk for timpani, cymbals, piatti, wind chimes, uh, bass, drum, glockenspiel, and celeste, cineharp, cinepiano, Spitfire symphonic strings, recorded it in staff pad, mixed in cupace. Um, he talks about how it might be used, what kind of scene, you know, uh, it's a flowing pastoral piece, uh, could be used to set the tone of the story, it takes place in outer space, uh, also sit nicely behind the nature environments, uh, forests, mountains, oceans, etc. And then he goes into the metadata. Um, melody in this piece is not obtrusive, could easily sit behind dialogue or narration. It's a calmness that makes it useful in many settings. When creating metadata for a cue to help identify the music's characteristics, you might include descriptions such as blissful, celestial, confident, heavenly, majestic, soaring, uplifting, etc. So anyway, very, very detailed in the fact that you can listen to the music. Um, makes it good. So I've already put out an invitation to have Steve join us to further elaborate why he wrote this book and how you guys might find it helpful. Um, so there you go on that. 
Uh, looking forward to hearing from Steve and having him on the show. He's always an incredibly good guest. Um, I saw somebody mentioning squirrels before, so I'm going to tell you, if anybody like doesn't want to hear about animals dying in nature, you may want to skip this part. I'll make it short and sweet, not too gross or descriptive. But oddly enough, I walked out in my backyard the other day, and uh, I think it was over the weekend, and maybe today's Tuesday, it was Sunday. Sunday afternoon, I was out in the backyard, and I looked up, we have a couple of giant pine trees in the backyard, and I looked up, uh, one of the trees has like an arm that looks like it's reaching out, it's a branch that reaches out and hugs the tree next to it. Um, and the reason I was looking up there is when it gets windy, and the two trees kind of separate that branch rubbing up against that other tree makes a super loud clicking sound and we would like to know for sure if that branch is the culprit that makes that sound because we can actually hear it in the house and i just found out my next door neighbor has a chainsaw so i was thinking well you know if i can be certain that that branch is the culprit maybe i'll borrow the chainsaw and trim the branch so i look up there and what do i see a dead bunny rabbit hanging there with this little bunny tongue hanging out of his mouth dead as a doornail and uh, hey keith lebrant um anyway i thought that that was highly unusual because the last time i checked bunny rabbits don't climb like 12 feet up in trees right they generally stay on the ground or in a burrow maybe but certainly not climbing trees well this rabbit looked like it had only been up there for a day or so it was clearly not of this world anymore and i thought well gonna have to get a ladder and a broomstick and get that little sucker out of there but i'm too hungry now so i'm gonna go uh grab dinner i think i, I was on my way to somewhere to grab dinner with a friend anyway um i went out there this morning there was no more bunny in the tree and then i looked and there was like a 10 foot debris field of bunny fur not a lot of it but little pieces here and there in the yard Nothing gory, no blood, no guts, no bunny bones or heads or anything like that. Thank God. Sorry, Liz. I know this is grossing out. She loves animals. We all love animals. Um, anyway, so I have deduced that I think that it is probably the work of the bobcat that I've seen in the backyard recently. And the reason I think that, um, I, at first I thought an eagle or a hawk. We do have hawks that will circle. There's a, a, a falcon that does hang out in our backyard. Looks like a peregrine falcon. And I see it maybe 10 times a year, in, excuse me, a particular tree in the backyard. But frankly, the falcon's just not that big. It's like you know, like a 12 or 14 inch bird. It's not big like a hawk with a five or six foot wingspan. I don't know if a peregrine falcon could actually lift a mid-sized bunny rabbit up in the air. Um, maybe, I don't know. Wow, Steve Barden is in the house. So Barden, yeah, um, let's talk about Monday right after I finish the bunny story. So anyway, uh, I figured, well, you know, I have seen shows about uh, the big cats on the plains of the Serengeti where they are like, I think leopards, cheetahs, other big cats are known to kill their prey and then drag it up in a tree and hang it, like drape it over a branch so that other animals can't get to it as easily. So who knows, maybe it was the bobcat. Whatever it was, it came back and ate the poor little bunny for lunch. So there you go. Um, I know it's very cat-like behavior to drag it up a tree, right? And I don't know that a hawk or, um, you know, a peregrine falcon does that if they, you know, like hide their stash. I can see them maybe taking something up in a tree and eating it. But whatever this was brought it back down to the ground to eat it. And, and I could actually see, you know, around it where the grass was kind of smushed down. So that's what make me... Uh, I'm just not. I know bobcats aren't big cats, but it's bigger than a house cat, smaller than a leopard, right? Um, could be an owl, except that the the grass was smashed around where the fur was left. Um, yeah, I've seen the peregrine falcon in our backyard dive, uh, you know, dive bomb a gopher or two. <laughs> Anyway, so there's that little interesting thing because I did see people mentioning the squirrels in the backyard and you guys know this is the time of year, you know, springtime. Um, well, now it's, 
I, almost summertime. Um, but it was about a year ago where the animals were so incredibly active in the backyard when we started doing the quarantine. The killer squirrel, that's it. You know, I believe that squirrels are in fact evil. I really do. Do you know, while I was gone for the five and a half weeks and we would see the squirrels on my, um, on my ring camera thing, um, that, wow, people were trying to text me, you're not online. Um, I was going to show you a picture of a squirrel at 545 this morning crossing our patio, but not that interesting. Anyway, uh, the squirrels were biting the fabric. The famous sunbrella doesn't fade in the sun fabric that some of the cushions on our lawn furniture are made out of. Those little squirrels were climbing up on the chairs and biting the fabric, trying to pull the stuffing out, probably to build their little squirrel nest. But each one of those cushions is like 35 bucks, so bad squirrel. <sighs> anyway, um, so there you go. Now let's talk about Andre's post in the comment section, which I really appreciate. Which wish more of you guys would do it. I love knowing what it is that you want to know about so I can talk about it, make the show more interesting than talking about dead bunnies and the such and such. Uh, so Andre says, once again, I'd like to have a library owner on for Q&A. Well, you know, you got me today, but uh, I'd like to know why libraries don't have a submission. I'd like to know, he's missing a word, I'd like to know why libraries that don't have a submission email on their website uh, don't want to be solicited, don't send you any current listings. So I'm going to unpack this kind of thought by thought. I think that was kind of a, either a run-on sentence or multiple thoughts coming out of Andre's head there. Um, so 10 years ago, a lot of musicians really didn't know about production music libraries or getting your music in film and TV. It just wasn't that big of a thing. And, and frankly, I'm kind of proud that Taxi really had a lot to do with um, bringing that whole concept forward to musicians all over the world. I mean, it kind of spread like wildfire, but I think that to at least some degree, if not a large degree, Taxi was the flashpoint on that, and certainly very early on uh, with education and, and with helping people get signed deals and get placements. So I'm proud of that and grateful that so many of you paid attention and found a, a path to success by doing it. One thing I've personally noticed is that back in the day, some of the libraries did in fact have a place, uh, some still do, where you can click to submit and upload music. But I have also noticed that the better libraries, the higher quality libraries, um, for the most part, this isn't 100%, but for the most part, they have taken those down. And the reason is, as I've said before in the show, they make their money by pitching music and getting it placed. So uh, they don't make money auditioning music. And a lot of these library owners, several of them are actually very good friends of mine. People that, you know, we talk to each other, you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night um, on weekends. You know, we're friends. We may not be like family friends like the Shirelli's are with the Lasco family, but we're friends nonetheless. Uh, and, and they have confided in me that they were disappointed when they still had the here's how to submit music to our library up on their website that they would listen to the stuff and just go oh my gosh does nobody understand the difference between tv music for instance or film music and music for records or the difference between a demo and a master the difference between broadcast quality and demo quality. Um, there was just so much that people just didn't know, but they would stumble on these websites and they would see, make a submission. And they would go, all right, somebody's gonna listen to my music. And they would very happily and gingerly click that field and attach a piece of music or upload it and send it to them. Um, and then drive the company crazy with follow-up emails. And, and the number that more than one of these library owners has given me is that 90% of the music that people uploaded to their site just was not very good. I, one of the guys actually used the word crap. He said, it was just crap. wasn't worth my time. Um, other people have echoed that same sentiment. So they, it didn't take them long to figure out that their time was much better spent pitching music and making money, which is good for you, because if they're making money, you're making money. 
So a lot of the libraries took that down. It's my personal observation. This is anecdotal and not 100% accurate, I'm sure. But many of the libraries that still have the ability for you to submit to them online probably aren't like the frontline A-rated libraries. There are always exceptions to everything I say in this show. That was just an anecdotal observation. But my observation is that the companies I see that still have a submission thing online sometimes or oftentimes really aren't the very best libraries. They're trying really hard to build their catalog so they are willing to listen to almost anything. Um, but here's the dirty little secret that I don't think any of these folks would tell you, um, but they've told me, and I'm not going to mention any names because I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but some big library owners that I know that have, and maybe some that still do have submission um, portals on their websites, have told me, have confided in me that they are often six weeks or more, sometimes months behind in listening to the music that people have uploaded. Um, when I first introduced Rob Shirelli, uh, and this is a guy you know with 100 gold and platinum records under his belt, uh, knows how to make great music, uh, knows how to engineer it, mix it, produce it, all that stuff, world-class guy. I introduced him to a library owner um, that's a personal friend of mine over a lunch like 10 years ago. And after that, I just bowed out and said, here you go, Rob, you guys talk. I don't want Taxi to have anything to do with this because you're both close friends of mine and it would be unfair to the members. If nothing else, it would just look bad. So if you guys want to do business, great. Well, about several months later, I got a call from Shirelli complaining to me that the library owner said, the only way you can submit to me, even though I met you through Michael and even though you know I know that you're like a multi-platinum person, is to submit through the website's submission portal. And uh, he was frustrated that he submitted stuff, a bunch of stuff, and it was like world-class record quality, hit record quality hip-hop tracks that ended up not going on people's records. And he figured, what the hell, might as well license them for, for films. They were that good. And the library owner heard some of the stuff and said, this is among the very best I've ever heard. He couldn't get his stuff heard in a timely fashion because he was using that portal. So that was the first time I had a clue about this being a problem. So even though, even if they do have a portal, chances are they're not being very efficient in using it. Um, so there you go. Um, there are always exceptions, but probably not a lot. So Andre went on to say, um, why do the libraries, and I'm paraphrasing a little here, why the libraries not want to be solicited? Um, it's because it used to be a much smaller club. Um, Ten years ago or more, you know, it was hardcore guys like Steve Barden, who's in the chat today, that were getting into this, and they already knew how to present themselves as a professional. They knew how to make great music. Um, they knew how to not blow a relationship. So it was okay for them to be, the libraries to be talking to guys at, at Steve's level. Um, Steve, let me know if your head gets too big to fit in the chat room. <laughs> uh, well, Steve is not an egotistical guy. He's a humble, hard work and soul he is. Um, anyway, as the word spread and it got out to the hoi polloi, uh, as it were, you know, and everybody who had anything from a crummy demo up to maybe even a hit record, everybody thought, oh, this is great for film and TV. As soon as they hear my song, they're going to want to put it in their next movie. Or as soon as they hear this instrumental, which is not constructed like a cue or constructed in any way that makes it very usable and desirable for film and TV, but I'm going to upload it anyway because I don't know the difference. And they put that stuff up there and these poor library owners would just listen to it and go, oh my gosh, I... There's a lot that people don't know. There are a lot of people that don't know what they don't know, I think. So uh, that's why they don't want to be solicited because they know that the vast majority of people, and uh, you know, that the vast majority of people that reach out to them 
don't know what the heck they're doing. They don't know the rules of the game, both on a musical level and a business level yet. So it's just a waste of time and a frustrating waste of time at that. Um, the reason that they don't send you any current briefs of what they want is the vast majority of people that would be on their email list wouldn't know how to respond to a brief. I was just talking to somebody. Who was it about? I can't remember now. A couple days ago, um, talking to somebody a few days ago, talking to somebody that said, oh my gosh, I cannot believe how people just send me music that has absolutely nothing to do with what I've asked for. And I said, oh yeah, I believe it. You know, I own Taxi. We get pretty darn specific in our listings that go out to people. And, um, you know, nobody, not nobody, a very large percentage of people send in music that just doesn't fit what is being asked for. And when you get them in a quiet moment, one-on-one, -on -one, and say to them, why? Why would you send this thing that has nothing to do with what was asked for? Well, it does have the word spirit in it and they were looking for something spiritual. And you just sit there going, really? You thought that that was enough to qualify it for a submission? Well, I thought when they heard it, they would just go, this is an amazing piece of music, and they would just put it in their TV show or their film. But of course, we all know, at least those of us who hang out in the Quarantini Happy Hour, soon to be renamed Quarantini Happy Hour, that, um, they're not just looking for great music. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of times where the music is great. They can't use it because it's not right for the scene. It's not right for the emotional content of the scene or for the film or the TV show. It doesn't have the right mood. It doesn't pull the right heartstrings. Many, many reasons that are all centered around mood and emotion or lyric content um, that it just doesn't work. Could be tempo, could be melody. There are all those different aspects. One thing I can tell you with almost absolute certainty is that probably in the history of film and TV, um, there have probably been less than 100 times in the history of all this stuff where anybody went, this song is just so freaking good that we're going to put it in the movie anyway, or we're going to put it in the TV show anyway. And probably like five times in the history of the world where somebody said, let's rewrite the scene. Now, you would have to be like, the Beatles or Led Zeppelin or somebody of that stature who's willing to license a song and doesn't really fit the scene and they're going to, you know what, we'll, we'll rewrite the scene because we would sure love to have a Beatles song in there. But if you're not the Beatles, if you're not Led Zeppelin, it's not going to happen for you. So let go of that fantasy. If you honestly think that somebody is going to hear your music and, and shove it in a film or a TV show, even though it doesn't fit, doesn't serve the scene like they needed to, you're crazy. Dude or dudette, you are friggin' delusional. Let go of that fantasy because it's not going to happen. So um, that's why they don't send out briefs to people they don't know or people they haven't done business with or people that have proved themselves to be reasonable, sensible, professional people that get that know the drill, right? So you've got to earn your way on that list, earn your way to be on that list. Um, how do you approach them? Are they basically telling you that we only use A&R companies for our music? Well, in the words of a music library owner that I spoke to a couple days after I got back from my trip, um, he recently put something on Twitter <clears throat> he needed a piece of music very quickly for something he was working on and he didn't feel that he had the right thing. So he actually put it up on Twitter, maybe Facebook, maybe Instagram, I don't know, put it up on social media. And he said, I have never been as appreciative of the work you guys do at Taxi as I was when I started listening to the music that came into me. <clears throat> Filtering makes all the difference. Taxi serves a pretty cool purpose in the world because we get them what they need, when they need it, and it is, I hate to even use the word because it's overused, but it's curated. I said that like I'm from somewhere in a Spanish-speaking country. It's curated. <laughs> it's curated. Um, we save them the time and the trouble of listening to all that stuff where people are just taking wild pot shots because they think their music is so great, somebody's going to love it and change the scene. So uh, I was really happy um, that that library owner made a point of telling me that. Um, 
that's taxi's raison d'etre, as we like to say. So how do you approach them? Um, are they basically telling you that they only use A&R company for their music needs? Well, if they're smart, they use an A&R company like Taxi because it saves them a lot of work and a lot of time. Why wouldn't they? And it's free to them. People often ask, do you charge these companies to do what you do for them? No, we don't. The reason I made that decision 29 years ago is I wanted as many opportunities as we could possibly have rolling in for you guys. And I figured if we charge people, it would probably cut down the number of requests by half, maybe even more. Didn't want that to happen. So um, how do you approach them? Well, honestly, the best way to approach them if you're gonna try to cold email them or cold call them, um, they always want to work with somebody who's experienced and already successful. Um, they don't really want to audition music from people they don't know. Frankly, they don't want to audition pe music from people they do know unless it's specifically submitted for something they need or they have a really long, um, fruitful history with that person. So the best thing you can do is after you've had you know, a moderate amount of success, you could send a very short, very, very specific email with it. First of all, the subject line means everything. Um, I would go with experienced composer would like to, um, experienced composer would like to establish a relationship. I, if I were a music library owner and I saw experienced composer would like to establish a relationship, I'd go, hmm, wonder who that is. Is somebody I know? What kind of experience are they talking about? And then the email, the, the body copy that I would put in that thing would be um, something on the order of, I've got dramedy, comedy, and blah, 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 and catalogs of these four companies and name the catalogs. Uh, especially if you know that they are companies that these guys would probably be aware of. If it's, you know, Tom and Jerry's music library that's a year old and some little rinky-dink library, don't throw it in there. It cheapens your image. But if you've got music and like moderately, if you've got music and catalogs that they would know, um, they're going to, uh, FOMO is going to kick in. They're going to want to hear what you've got because they don't want their competitors to get it. So that's the best way to go about it is a very short, not like, hey, can you check out my music? Because they get that all the time. And what does check music out really mean? Um, be a professional and just say experienced composer uh, would like to establish a relationship. Um, I should charge you for that advice. It's so good. And then just a couple of sentences at most. They don't need to know your life history. All they need to know is these genres are my strong ones and these are the libraries that I'm in. And if you've had three or four placements recently that would impress them, even if it's just a reality show placement, if you're good enough to get signed and good enough to get placed, then they will want to know you. So there you go. Um, Tom and Jerry's cheap A&R company. Uh, let's see. I just saw Keith LeBrant in the room. So, Keith, uh, you're experienced. Does that sound like uh, solid advice to you? Oh, there you go. I like Keith's idea. Send them a link to your music um, so they can check it out without you actually saying. There's nothing they hate more than getting a folder attached to an email. Um, nobody likes to dump a bunch of music on their hard drive and fill up the hard drive, number one, take a risk, uh, a chance of getting uh, a virus. <laughs> Isn't it funny how the, the risk of getting a virus has taken on a whole new meaning? Uh, Keith says, yep, I just typed something above this to check out the composer's music without sending. Yep, uh, do not send MP3s. There you go. All right, so Andre, if you're watching the show tonight, uh, I think I just answered your question. And frankly, 
The people that the libraries, once you've gotten into a library, if you find out that friends of yours who are also in the library um, are getting emails where the library owner is forwarding briefs to people and you're not on that list, it may be that the relationship is too new. Probably has more to do with that they know that these are the five composers, the 17 composers, the two composers, pretty small number of people who are really good in the genre. So when they have a specific need, they reach out to those people. Again, if they've got 600 composers in their catalog and they forward a brief to all 600 composers, some of those composers are going to be really good at orchestral, not dramedy. Some of those composers are going to be really good at uh, uplifting, light, lilty, happy little acoustic guitar pieces, not dramedy. Some of those composers are going to be really good at doing sweaty palm drones. That's a new genre I just invented. Um, other composers, you know what I'm saying, uh, is they're only going to reach out to the people that they know are they're kind of all stars in the dramedy category. Why would they want to listen to music from a dozen or several dozen or hundreds of other composers that may or may not be that good at, at, at dramedy? Um, Andre's in the room. Yay, Andre. Dude, thank you. I really appreciate that you asked those questions. Um, There you go. Pedro's in the room confirming what Keith LeBrant said, so we've got it all buttoned up. Uh, Keith LeBrant <laughs> specializes in squirrel bunny abduction music. There you go. Um, by a band called Bob and the Cats, or maybe Hunter and the Hawks. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, sweaty Palm Drone. There you go. All right, so that's that. Um, is Steve Barden still in the room? Because I just plugged his book again a few minutes ago. I, I plugged it when I wasn't even on the air. Um, and Steve, I hope you can join me for the show on Monday. Uh, question, if I may, from Dave Ericali. I have music online that's affiliated with an aggregator. What do we need to do to submit to exclusive listings? Well, aggregating it, for the purpose of downloads and selling it is pretty okay. Um, a lot of the aggregators, several of them, will also have a box where you can do like, you know, this kind of, th the pro level thing. Would you like us to help you monetize your music? Oh, heck yeah. And you check the box and the next thing you know, you've either signed a publishing agreement with them, which could be exclusive, it could be non-exclusive, it varies with the different companies, or it might be an admin deal. But uh, if, you know, another library, how can I say this? Some of the non-exclusive libraries are okay with that. I can tell you for an absolute fact, the exclusive libraries get downright pissed off, really angry. This is a thing with them. Um, the number of people that submit music to them that is, you know, with um, TuneCore, CD Baby, or whomever, uh, and I'm not slamming those companies. I know them and I like them, but musicians tend to not remember that they signed those deals. They tend to not understand the scope of the deal that they signed. And music libraries, really, you can really hurt your reputation and or budding relationship with one of these companies after you've been forwarded by taxi or met them on your own. Um, and then uh, they go through the due diligence of checking out more mus your music online. They read your bio. And then as part of the due diligence, they find out, oh, look at that. That person is actually signed to a publishing deal already through this aggregator. And they get really pissed off about that. They just wasted um, some of their time, a lot of their time. Um, so imagine if that happens to you as a library owner several dozen times a week, which it does. That's why they have us put that stuff in, in some of the listings where it says, please don't submit to this if you are not professional in dealing with libraries or if your music is represented by the aggregators. So there you go, Dave. Remember, um, I think it's perfectly fine to use an aggregator like CD Baby or TuneCore or whomever to sell your music or distribute your music. The minute that you check that box where they can license the music or act as your, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I can't remember now, but you know, bottom line is that's really problematic. Um, 
So should I ask to have that removed? Yes, I believe that some, if not several of the companies will actually let you out of that portion of the deal. You don't have to let go of the digital distribution, but you can ask them to release you. The, the guys in the chat room could probably tell you more accurately than me because I've never actually done it. Um, anyway, so yeah, um, some of them, uh, I think that there's like a 30 day wait period once you ask them, don't just assume if you've sent them a formal email saying, please let me out of your CD Baby Pro or whatever it is. Um, don't go submit the music tomorrow because you're not out until they tell you you're out. Um, so uh, Steve, as long as you're in the room, are you good for a show on Monday? Can we uh, talk about your book? Keith LeBron married somebody overseas by accidentally checking that box. Uh, don't tell your wife. Or was she the one? <laughs> Is that on a per song basis? Yeah, um, just because you, yeah, but remember, if you submit an album's worth of material to be distributed uh, online and you check that box, every song on the album would therefore be covered. But if you've done some single song deals, um, for them to ask, act as your admin company or publisher, yay, Barden is good. Okay, you guys get it first. Steve Barden will be my official guest on Monday's show so that we can talk about his brand new book, Deconstructing Production Music for TV. Yay! Or should it have been? <laughs> nah, we never laugh at Steve. Not to his face. <laughs> Um, anyway, well, that's exciting. I love having Steve on the show. He's a great guest, and uh, I'm sure that we'll do some Q&A. All right. So what else should we talk about? Oh, I think I mentioned this when I was not broadcasting and thought that I was. Um, there's a website that you guys should check out. Um, I stumbled on this the other day and found it to be an extremely valuable website, uh, and it's free to use. It is called Have I Been PWNED.com. Have I Been Passworded.com. Here, I'm going to type it out for you. Um, and I'll tell you what they do in a second. Whoops. Have I Been PWNED.com. I believe that's it. Okay, Steve's a funny guy. I don't know about that. <laughs> Let's take a vote. Nah, he's funny. He's got a very dry sense of humor, which I appreciate a great deal. Um, anyway, you go to this website and you type in your email address. Um, Paul House uses it all the time. And you will find that there's a really high probability that like 15 different entities on the internet actually have the password to your email address, to your various accounts. I've got about six different emails and all but one of them, my passwords had been um, copied or cracked or whatever. So there you go. Um, Will Steve Barden be sitting next to me like the old times? I'm not going to even ask him. He lives a good hour away from me now in traffic going back. It'd probably be an hour and a half to where he lives. So I'm thinking let's do it remote. Um, I know that he's got good bandwidth because I've done remotes with him before. Um, so there you go. Which is why you must use 2FA. What? Tell us what that is, 2FA. That F or a T? 2FA, right? You live two hours away. OK, I'll send my private jet. <laughs> <laughs> or should I send the Bell Ranger helicopter? Yeah, I'll send that. Two-factor authentication. Got it. 
Um, wow. Um, I always get asked if I want to use 2FA from uh, Gmail and my a couple of my other accounts. Um, so every time I log into that account, do I have to type in the stuff for two forms of identification? Is that how that works? You can tell all the all the nerdy techie guys who are answering this question. <laughs> all the guys who do IP for a living, stand up and raise your hand. Oh, I got, they usually text you. So I've got to, every time I want to log on to my email, it checks the password, then texts me, and then I have to type in a number before I can actually get in. Yikes. That sounds like a pain in the butt. But I guess considering a bunch of people already have my passwords, what the hell? Yes, Jim, uh, when, you are, when your password has been um, compromised, absolutely change the password, and it sounds like go for 2FA. Um, there you go. I always give out my ex-wife's credentials. I fear, why hack me when you could cause her a lot of pain and agony? Um, all right, that's all I've got for today. Uh, but we can hang out for a while longer because I was so... Yeah, just enter your social security number in this link I send you. There you go. Um, change your password often. What if you've got two-factor authentic, authentic, <laughs> authentic, authentication? Why can't I want to say authentication? What if you've got two-factor? Uh, why? I've been this way all day today. I did wake up with um, like vertigo. I hope I don't have like a brain tumor or something. Um, God forbid. Anyway, um, do you still have to change your password if you do 2FA? Just say 2FA. See, there you go, Akira. I catch on pretty quick. Not as dumb as I look. Taxis, music, not music, happy hour. I wish I loved it, Nancy. Sorry. The, Paul says, basically, once you get an email address, they can just sit in and read your email without you knowing. Um, with 2FA, no need to change passwords regularly. There you go. Okay, I am going to set that up on all of my stuff tonight. Michael has a peculiar way to solve the problem. <laughs> Yeah, I've been able to come up with some uh, name. I'm tough, Michael. I know. I'm, I'm just trying so hard to come up with a name to replace Quarantini Happy Hour. Um, I really did, only thought we'd be doing the Quarantinis for like a couple of weeks, and here we are like 15, 16 months later. Um, uh, Ghost of Young Michael, just want to say, taxis helped me move forward a ton in the last year. I really appreciate all of you. Thank you for saying that. Um, We'd love to hear that stuff, you know. It's really good for the whole staff to know that the work we do every day, which can be pretty grueling, um, is appreciated. So thank you. Um, no more info on the road rally yet. I just announced the other day that the state of California is making its official proclamation, which will change two days later, I'm sure. Uh, and I did speak to the hotel people. They are going to look and see what the state says on the 15th, and then we'll talk in the 16th or 17th to figure it out. I do know that we need to deal with not only the state of California and the federal laws, uh, which I don't think really affect us all that much right now, um, but we also have to deal with L.A. County and L.A. City. Um, by Steve Barton, just dropping in to plug your book, huh? I know the type. <laughs> All right, thanks. I'll see you Monday. I'll talk to you before then. Thanks, buddy. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, no real news until somewhere around the 16th or 17th. Uh, thank you, Ghost of Young Michael. Um, Fauci jumping in, Delta Red Alert. I don't know what that means. The social distance hour. 
I, here's the problem it is I, I want it to be descriptive because before I knew it was like for the inside crowd, you know, it was people that already watched Taxi TV, Taxi members. So Quarantini Happy Hour implied, hey, we're doing it while we're quarantined and it's just a hang, which was all it was intended to be. Uh, oh, Delta, a new COVID strain. Got it. Um, so that name worked great. Actually, I think it was Ar Ariana that came up with Quarantini part of it, which was the name of a drink that people were inventing. Um, but I want the name to tell you what you're going, what it's about, what we do. Um, and it's really, really hard to come up with something that's descriptive and cute. So I may go with descriptive more than cute. Um, and yes, I do want taxi in there as part of the branding. Um, a social distance hour. <laughs> oh, Keith LeBrant says, for what it's worth, you hit it out of the park with the virtual rally. I know it can't take the place of real rally, but it was great. Thank you for that. You know, frankly, um, I, I will admit that I was really, really happy with the outcome last year. Um, it was hard to get that all coordinated. Bria was a tremendous help. Um, the company that we worked with to do the video production, very pro. Um, and, but they expected us. They really wanted us to hire like an executive producer or a line producer, actually, that would um, do a lot of the stuff that Bria and I did in advance. And there was a lot that went into it, you know. Um, first of all, conceptualizing how the whole thing would be, then deciding do we broadcast each thing as its own separate entity each hour, um, coming up with the concept for the title cards, which I believe I stole from Fender's YouTube channel, the basic idea for I didn't just actually rip it off. Um, coming up with the theme music. Thank you, Keith LeBrant. Um, uh, and he nailed it like right out of the box. I said, give me something like Van Halen-esque or Led Zeppelin-esque and or ZZ Top-esque in the, in the piece that he sent. I mean, he just totally nailed it. Um, so that made life easy, but then we had to get various versions of it. And then we had to look at everything that we broadcast during the road rally and go, okay, so what is gonna follow this? Do we have a pre-recorded thing from a sponsor that follows it? Do we go to another live thing? And we had to have the timing layout because we couldn't just go dark for you know five minutes. Um, we had to make sure that all the panelists showed up and went into the green room and that we checked their video signal and their audio levels, bring them electronically out of the green room into the actual room. Um, I think I need a sip of Rockstar. Warm, flat Rockstar. Wow, not good. Um, and just a million little elements like that. And then we had to put together a giant spreadsheet of how everything went. Uh, the guy who was saying, our technical director, had to know. We couldn't just say, okay, in like 30 seconds, man, we're gonna do this. It had to be out, all laid out in a spreadsheet so that if I didn't remember, it was gonna happen anyway. If Bria didn't remember, it was going to happen anyway and he, and he would literally look at me over the top of the camera and the monitors and go you know like five four three two one and i go hey welcome back so it was like a real tv production um it was a lot of fun it was a lot of work and the good news is if if we are not able to do an in-person rally this year that we've got the system down for doing it. Um, so I'll be able to spend more time coming up with fresh ideas for panels and panelists, uh, less time worrying about the logistics of it all. Oh, I am a sip of rock star. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I love Keith. Uh, he, he just absolutely nailed it. People hear it and they go, yeah, that's kind of like uh, ZZ Top. But it's... Um, 
it's got the spirit you know it does it, it's like fun it's rock and roll it doesn't take itself too seriously um I don't know if you're asking me that about my wife going MIA. Um, <laughs> ZZ middle versus ZZ on top or the bottom. Um, yeah, so there you go. We're, uh, we're prepared to do it either way. I mean, we certainly have tons of experience doing it live and in person. Uh, what I am fearful of is if there are all kinds of restrictions, which I anticipate are going to be a thing, it may make it impossible to do a really good road rally in person. While I am absolutely dying to see all of your faces, and I really mean that, that especially you guys who hang out in the quarantinis. I mean, we have become a, a weird little family over the past year or so. So it would be such a joy for me to meet a lot of you guys that I feel like I know, you know, know well. Um, and uh, spend time in person with you. However, uh, like if we can't do the, the meet or eat and greet lunches, if we have to limit the number of people in the ballroom and do a lottery to decide who's in there, there are all kinds of things. Uh, hopefully I'll know around the 16th or 17th um, and I will announce it as soon as I know. Uh, partially both ways, impossible. To do a, a video, we've estimated it would be $10,000 a day just for the video and tech direction at the hotel. So yeah, if you guys want to pay like $500 a ticket for the road rally, I'm down. I know who to hire, um, but it's expensive. You know, I mean, just think about that. For the ballroom alone, we'd need a far shot that encapsulated all the panelists. We need a camera on me because I'm moderating. And then we'd need a third camera to go to the panelists and possibly a fourth because while you're on one panelist, you'd want the second cameraman going, um, the shot wouldn't be visible yet, but you'd want the cameraman on and focused on the next person that's gonna be asked a question. Um, like a real TV show, you know? So um, that takes at least three or four people just in the ballroom. Um, last year cost me, I want to say $2,000 a day for one person. Okay. So if we've got, and that's just the ballroom. So let's say we've got, um, four people in the ballroom. That's 8,000 bucks a day for the ballroom only. And then what do we do for the classrooms? There's that. So anyway, you get the idea. It would be extremely expensive to do. We could do it, uh, but you know what? If we did it 50-50 uh, where it was live at the hotel and broadcast live, I'm sure that would be awesome for a lot of you. You wouldn't have to get on a plane um, or have any of the expense of coming to Los Angeles. On the other hand, we wouldn't get a lot of people showing up for the road rally because they would just get lazy and go, why should I spend 500 bucks when I could just sit at home and watch it for free? But we know for a fact that not everybody watched a lot of the rally for free. A lot of people did, but a lot of people didn't. And the bigger issue is if you don't come to the road rally, you're not going to meet music library owners. You're not going to meet um, uh, music supervisors. You're not going to meet label people. You're gonna, not going to meet collaborators. Um, so all, all that stuff just falls by the wayside uh, if we were to do a 50-50, which I am not a fan of that idea. <laughs> and Paul House says, I really think people don't understand just how much work goes into these events. And uh, it is insane. And, and thank you that you're grateful for it, Paul. Um, there's no way to describe it. I mean, frankly, even a lot of my staff really doesn't know because they don't really need to get involved until a few days before the rally and then they work their butts off actually at the rally. Actually, at the rally is the easy part for me. It's the six months leading up to the rally that are the hard part. Um, and that's right, the beer does p taste better at the Westin. <laughs> 
<laughs> if we did it both live and in per or uh, video and in person, it'd be five hundred and forty dollars a submission. There you go. Mix in some drone footage. I love it. Yeah, very few people actually know that. Um, several times I've gone into the grand ballroom on Thursday night after they've got the stage set up and the sound is all dialed in and the sound guys go to grab dinner and the hotel guys are done setting up the chairs and everything in there. I go in there with a remote control, a battery operated remote control airplane and fly it around the ballroom for about an hour all by my lonesome and that's how I get the stress out uh, before I do it. My brother is co-owner of Canacon. That's all they do is put on conventions. What's Canacon? Is that like a, a weed cannabis con? Is that like... Can you get me a free ticket, Ken? <laughs> um, ooh, the crab cakes were good at the West, and that's good to know. I've never tried them. Yeah, I'm anxious to get back to the West, and... Um, Plus, I haven't seen the cab now in a year and a half. Anyway, all right, you guys. I think it's about time to wrap this puppy up. Um, thank you for joining me today. I will be back on Thursday. We will do another quarantini happy hour until we figure out a great name for it. If you have any other ideas, I know I'm really picky, but the objective is the word taxi should be in it for branding. It should be descriptive and it can't just be like the taxi sync hangout, you know, because it's not just about sync. Um, so pop some ideas into the comments after this video goes up on YouTube. Um, I will see you on Thursday and don't forget Steve Barden will be our guest on Monday. Thanks you guys. Have a great rest of your evening. Take care. See you soon. Where's that button? There it is. Bye-bye. Yeah, don't forget to give us a like and hit the um, subscribe button.